In the United States, the church and the evangelical church is, is much like a large corporation. It's an institution. And there's some good things about that. I make my living off of that industry. You know, people go to Christian bookstores, buy my books. And so I'm grateful for that. And there are professionals uh, writing plays and developing videos and creating small group curriculum. You know, there's all that stuff going on. Uh, in the UK, of course, the, the corporation is much smaller in size, reaching a, a smaller percentage of, of the population. And it's, I think it's easy for evangelicals in a country like this to feel like that beleaguered minority, especially because you do have a history of faith. You have been the, the source for much of the world. Uh, however, I like going to a place like the UK or Australia, New Zealand, or even um, Canada, which is different than the United States, for a couple of reasons. For one thing, the church may be more likely to be united or at least less divided. In the United States, you, you could live in your entire life and not meet someone who's not a Southern Baptist in parts of the country, you know. Well, you can't do that here. And often, Evangelical Alliance is a, is a good uh, demonstration of that. The, the, the churches, because they do feel we are a minority, let's emphasize what we have in common instead of what divides us. And that's a very healthy thing. And I also find that, um, that there's a spark of creativity, especially among young evangelicals. There's, there's, uh, if, if you go to church in the UK, you don't go because it's socially advantageous. It's not. Everybody around you is sleeping in and watching football. You know? Why would you go to church? Well, you only go to church, you only worship with people if you believe that it's true. <laughs> The question of the book, What Good Is God?, is a question that uh, I think occurs to most people at some point. It's one that's voiced openly by skeptics like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins in your country, Sam Harris in our country. They're saying if there is a God, he he's not good. It just it doesn't add up. And there are people who have responded to them with apologetics arguments, philosophical arguments, theoretical arguments. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a scholar, theologian. I'm a journalist. And so what I like to do is go out into the real world and test faith. The subtitle in, in the American edition is In Search of a Faith That Matters. Does faith really matter? And in the book, I, I use the phrase tabletop test. Uh, that's a phrase I got from engineers in Silicon Valley, California, when they come up with a new iPad, for example, it can be the sleekest model with the most memory and the best design and the greatest screen, but there's one last test they do before they release it to the public. They knock it off a table <laughs> and let it clatter to the ground because that's the real world out there, and that's what people do. They knock them out of airline bins, they spill coffee on them, knock them on the floor, and unless the machine can survive that kind of treatment, it's not going to work. You can't release it. And so this book takes a look at challenging situations in which I found myself as a journalist. Things like the Mumbai terrorist attack. We were there that night. I was supposed to speak right in sight of the Taj Mahal Hotel. Uh, Virginia Tech after a campus massacre, a convention of prostitutes, a convention of alcoholics. And in each case, I asked the question, did your faith matter? What difference does it make that you're a person of faith? Did it help? Um, does it survive that tabletop test? Now these are obviously extreme samples and many, many people, hopefully most people, don't have to go through that kind of thing. But we all do have our own tabletop tests of faith, whether it's losing a job or a child with a, with a birth defect, chronic illness, putting a parent in an Alzheimer's ward. I mean, these are the tests where we wonder, 
does, does it make any difference that I believe? That what, what good is God in a situation like that? So that's the question I was addressing. As a journalist, I went out. There are 10 different places, locations, and in each case I tell the story going on. And then what I said to the people gathered, looking for some kind of word of, of counsel or comfort or hope, depending on what the situation was. So in a sense, writing, writing a book like this is my own tabletop test of faith because I have to face, what do I believe? What can I say to people going through something this extreme? People have asked me, why is there a chapter of, on C.S. Lewis in a book about you know, tragedies and extreme things happening? Actually, I don't know of a more severe test of faith than being a, an outspoken Christian Don <laughs> professor at a, at a place like Cambridge and Oxford where you know Christians are just kind of patronized and oh yes you believe those fairy tales and Lewis faced that all of his life he was never given a chair at Oxford that he richly deserved just because of the the prejudice against Christians and uh, Lewis pointed the way toward a gentlemanly and civil engagement with a, a rigidly secular culture around him and that's, that's Europe, isn't it? And increasingly it's the United States as well. So uh, when, whenever, whenever I write any book, the first thing I do, maybe not the first thing, but an early thing that I do is go to my shelf of books by C.S. Lewis. And I, if I write a book on Jesus, if I write a book on prayer, I go through and read everything that he said about those particular topics. <laughs> For younger leaders, I would say uh, take risks. Um, there's an old saying that if if you're not um, if if you're not a radical by the time you're 30, you have no heart, and if you're not a conservative by the time you're 60, you have no brain. <laughs> And I just turned 60, so I can look back and, and see that. And, and young people have passion. I remember so clearly, I grew up, I was going through adolescence in the 1960s in, in college years where everything, I mean, we were concerned about poverty and racism and the environment. And we were just awakened to all the problems of the world. And, and we wanted to fix them. We wanted to change them. And then there were these, our parents, who had lived through depression and the war, and they just kind of, don't rock the boat, don't rock the boat. And um, we had such a hard time understanding their viewpoint. Well, now, uh, in, in some ways, those problems have intensified compared to when I was young. But now I look at them and say, you know, there's some of these things that we're probably not going to fix, as it were. But I'm so glad that there are younger, passionate leaders who say, Yes, but we've got to take on human trafficking. We've got to take on and fill in the blank. So I see these younger leaders who are, who with energy and passion and maybe unrealistic energy and passion are, are tackling these enormous problems. Bono would be a good example. He's, he's neither 30 or 60, he's in between. But he, he tackles these huge things, AIDS, <laughs> you know, and somehow raises $15 billion so uh, he, he's able to, to, to bridge back and forth. And I would just say to the, to the younger leaders, use, don't squelch your passion too soon. You will grow old and you will eventually say, I guess I can't do everything. But right now you think you can, so go for it. <laughs>